ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930 present The Drive. Elmore deep left that three is good! From 30 feet, John Elmore! The Drive with Paul Swan. Welcome into the Wednesday, September 5th edition. The Drive begins now on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Tonight on the program, David Kahn's going to join me for the final time this baseball season as the West Virginia Power ended their season yesterday. No postseason for them, so David's going to join me. We will also talk to the play-by-play announcer of Eastern Kentucky, Greg Stodelmeyer. He's going to join me on the program a little bit later on. We're going to preview Eastern Kentucky Plus. We'll take your phone calls. But, uh, yeah, go back to that West Virginia Power thing. Uh, They entered their season on Monday. It was Monday. So I'm driving into the station, and I get the text from David Kahn. I knew about it a few minutes after it happened. He was on the bus. Like, yeah, season's over. So, okay, we'll come in on Wednesday. We can't pass up the opportunity the opportunity to do this one more time at least. So, you know, I, I was kicking around with him. We might do the podcast. I don't know if that's going to be something we can make our schedules work with, but that might happen. But Dave is going to join me a little bit later on. But I'm excited. Uh talked a little bit earlier uh, on the phone with uh, Greg Stodemeyer, and he remembers a lot. I was looking at him on Twitter earlier, just following him and seeing some things that he was bringing up. Remember Eastern Kentucky? Now, for some of you, you're like, Eastern Kentucky, I don't remember a thing about Eastern Kentucky. I wasn't even born the last time Eastern Kentucky played Marshall. I got that from some people. People work here. Like, yeah, I wasn't born when when they played last. Or I was too young to even know about that. But it's been a while. These are close schools. It's not a uh, long drive. But when you're in what is now... FBS, and when they're in what's now FCS, sometimes it's kind of hard to schedule them on a on a consistent basis. And you don't want to just bring them in every year. You want to play some other teams as well. But I think this would be, you definitely look at Eastern Kentucky. You need an opponent. You bring in an FCS team now and then. Bring in an Eastern Kentucky. Put them back on the schedule. I definitely think uh, there'll be some fans who maybe like it. Just, yeah, a little nostalgia for this series. This isn't going to be the resumption of hostilities between these two because they played each other forever, it felt like. They haven't played that much, but they have played a good amount. But the thing is, it feels like it went on for a while because it happened every year. So this is going to be the 20th meeting between these schools. And here's a nugget you probably didn't remember. Some of you did, but Fairfield Stadium, the final college game that was played at Fairfield back on November 10th of 1990, EKU won that game 15-12 to against Marshall. And so you look at that and you think, I want to get these guys. Because I'm a student at Marshall. I'm like, you want to get these guys. We're going to see them again. I want to get these guys. And then Marshall goes into the new stadium and takes care of business. Final two times these two schools met up in the FCS playoffs, 1991 and 92. Uh, But Marshall is victorious on those occasions. EKU has won in Huntington before. EKU and Huntington, uh, their record is 4-6-1. So Marshall has the 6-4-1 advantage. Over them in Huntington. Uh, overall, the series is Marshall's 10 8 and a tie there. Notes weren't very helpful on this, so I had to piece this together. If I've done my research correctly, the series is 4 4 in Richmond. And I was trying to figure out did they count? There was a couple of games played in Ashland. It was, I think the Elks put this together. I was. Researching this, so they've actually met before in a football game, not in Huntington or Richmond, and I don't think that's factored into this. I don't think that counts. So we're going to talk about Eastern Kentucky, get an idea of what this team's about so we can all be better educated because, again, it's been a long time since we've seen Eastern Kentucky or talked about Eastern Kentucky, and it's just football. Now, in other sports, of course, it makes perfect sense. You'll see Marshall play 
Eastern Kentucky and other sports all the time. It makes perfect sense. But football, it's just been a forgotten series to a degree. But the previous meeting for these schools, the last time that Marshall played Eastern Kentucky, November 27th, 1992. Marshall won that one 44 to nothing. So there's a little history for you there as we get this set. Eastern Kentucky, they beat Moorhead. They're, they're pretty good at their level. I don't know how good Moorhead is, but EKU is way better. They dropped 404 yards on them rushing. Four touchdowns. It was a 49-23 win. They haven't done 400-plus yards in several years. They've got a couple of really talented running backs. You heard Doc talking about uh, the team. Daryl McCleskey, he had 125 yards. L.J. Scott had 86, but a couple of touchdowns for him. And they used three quarterbacks in that game. Dakota Allen's their lead, 93 yards. He had one touchdown. Yeah, they had three quarterbacks that played. Marshall, we couldn't find out until close to game time which quarterback of Marshall's would play, and it was Isaiah Green with 272 yards and two touchdowns. Good performance from him. So it's going to be interesting to see what it breaks down to. Eastern Kentucky is going to come in, and I think they're going to be a competitive team. I don't know if it's going to be competitive for a quarter, a half, three quarters, down to the wire. But I think it's going to be a competitive game nonetheless. And it's going to be more of a challenge for Marshall than maybe Marshall fans think. With that said, I think this still belongs to Marshall. This is Marshall's game. And I don't think they're looking past EKU either. Just talking to him earlier this week. I don't think South Carolina has even come up yet. They might see South Carolina if they walk by the schedule poster. That's the only time they see South Carolina come up. As it should be. This will be a solid test. This will be okay. I don't think 404 yards are going to happen against the herd, though. I will be surprised if EKU can put 404 rushing yards on Marshall. Passing yards, we'll see. Maybe they get a decent amount of passing yards on Marshall. Maybe not. But 404 rushing yards not happening against the Thundering Herd. If that's the case, South Carolina is going to be a long day. But, again, nothing against Eastern Kentucky. Don't take anything away from them because they will be a good, solid, stiff test for the Thundering Herd. You kind of want that. I was trying to ask a couple of the guys, hey, you see this sort of a tune-up game? Just go out there and work on yourself. And they're like, no, this is game. No, we're not. We're always working on ourselves, but no, this is n- game. We're focused on Eastern Kentucky, not overlooking them. Good attitude there. We will come back. We'll talk to David Kahn from the West Virginia Power. Get his post mortem on the season later on in the program as well. We're going to talk Eastern Kentucky with Greg Stodelmeyer. Get his thoughts on the upcoming game between Marshall and Eastern Kentucky. Later on, your phone calls are welcome. It's The Drive on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Now, back to The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back to the September 5th edition Drive on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. The segment of The Drive Fueled by sadness because David Kahn's joining me from the West Virginia Power, and we're not here to talk about the Power postseason. Instead, uh, we're here to talk about our upcoming podcast, Swan and Kahn. Is that what we're going with? That's the working title I'm going with. I don't know if you got something better. I, I like it. I like it. Swan, Swan and Con rolls off the tongue very nicely. I, it's comical. It's original. I, I think it's a good working title. Okay, we can we can work on this podcast for for next week or. Is it going to be you, me, talking about Marshall and Tulane? Is that the concept we're going well, with? No, it, it, that, well, no, that, that's the great thing about it, is that it can be literally talking about whatever we want. I, I think the, the way that we make it you know, applicable to all fans is that the listeners send in topics to you, at, and you and I go through the topics and figure out, all right, these are the ones that each of us can take a different stance on, and then we just go back and forth. 
and and you know sometimes we'll agree with the points, but the, you know I think I think the the funniest moments that we've had this year are when we are you know we're kind of joshing back and forth on a different idea, regardless of whether or not we agree with each other or not. I think it's just been I think it's been comical to do that. So I think turning that into a long form podcast might be rather interesting. Okay, we might have to do this. Uh, but let's talk about the power first and foremost. Uh, of the course. power had their opportunities. There were chances to still get this thing done. What happened? You know, you're right. They did. And, uh, I mean, it's so tough to look back on it because at the end of the day, the power won eight of their last 11 games. And you look at that and you're like, wow, they finished the season strong. Yes, that's true. They did. But you look at it more under a microscope, and they won seven in a row and then lost three of their last four. So that's not how you want to finish. And the funny part about it is, is we going into the final game of the regular season, the Power had thrown seven consecutive quality starts. Their bullpen had an ERA of 0.93 over the last seven ga- those last same seven games. So basically it was like you couldn't put more than three earned runs on the West Virginia Power, and no team did. I mean, they were that good on the mound and in the bullpen. Uh, and it, it just, you know, sometimes they just didn't roll our way. Charleston has our, had our number this year with one-run games and, and extra inning games. They never, you know, let us have an easy win. You know, they I think seven of the 11 games we played with Charleston was a one-run game, and they just threw some really good pitching out of those last two games. We, we with the, the feeling around the locker room on Sunday after Hagerstown beat Canapolis was, all right, let's finish it off today. And Odie Nunez threw his longest start of the year, seven and a third, allowed three earned runs, and we lost three to two. So you're like, all right, go back at it tomorrow. You know, you have the kitchen sink. Everyone in the bullpen was available, and everyone in the bullpen threw really, I mean, you know, Ryan Valdez came in and threw a career high four and a third inning. We'll get that squared away here in a second uh, as his cell phone was dropping out. But had to be super disappointing for the power because there were opportunities for them to, to finish out and get into the postseason. They worked really hard to get themselves in that position. I think that's the toughest thing. It's not you're just playing out the string because you know you're ready to go, move on. You're trying to still get to a point where you're improving, getting to the next level. You want to go out there. These guys want to go out and win this thing. It's not necessarily going to be the greatest moment of their career, but it's going to be the greatest moment of their of their career at this time to go out there and compete for a championship. So it had to be a tough bus ride, definitely knowing that this was going to be it. Some of these guys might not see each other again. There will definitely be a roster change next year. Some guys will be coming back. Some guys will be moving up. Some guys will be moving on. So not many opportunities there for this particular group to get it done anymore. And now we welcome him back. David Kahn, so disappointed. The phone even, the phone's even sad. David, I I know it, it's it's. I mean, it, look, it was a disappointing end to a a great season, though. I mean, you look back on this team, and there were so many defining moments of how good this team is and how good these players can be. And I think that's what we have to take away from this year, Paul. Now, this could this group, as I was mentioning, you're not going to see this group again because some players are going to come back, some players are going to move up, some players are going to move on. So it had to be tough for a lot of these guys knowing that, all right, this is it. The the finality of it is uh, has sunk in. You know, we as a group will never get to do this again. You're right. It was it was tough for those guys to have that realization. You could see it as we got off the bus back in Charleston at like, you know, 3 a.m. that Monday morning and – all the guys were just, you know, sitting there and going and and they were, you know, they, they were all just looking around going like, man, I mean, this is it. We, uh, you know, this is the last time we're going to see all these guys together in the same clubhouse in the same locker room. Now, granted, they might have that same, you know, type of group up in double A and triple A when they move up. But, you know, you're right. It's never going to be the same exact group of people together. So what happens now for a minor league baseball team? Once the season's over, you're not getting ready for the postseason. What's that process like? Because do these guys just disperse? 
Um, are there exit interviews? What happens at this level? So at, after the season ends, they go ahead and do uh, – some will go to instructional league. Some will go to the fall league, the Arizona fall league. You know, some will just go back home and, and you know, go into their own offseason programs. Some will go, you know, do their own thing. Uh, you know, it really depends on basically, you know, what their specific type of uh, year-long program and what the Pirates envision them doing down the road. So it changes for every player, but, you know, there were a lot of our guys that are going to the Instructional League. There are a lot of our guys that are continuing their baseball seasons in other areas of the world. And uh, there are a lot of guys that are just looking forward to, you know, getting better and getting ready for next season, especially in the younger leagues. You see a lot of instructional league play, a lot of fall league play, because these guys have a lot to work on. And sometimes during the end of a season, you know, you kind of get out of your routine a little bit. You have to get back into what you were doing well and and keep keep using it uh, effectively as you finish off your your 2018, we'll say, agenda. David Collins joining us from the West Virginia Power. So now that the season's over, you get to go back and do Tulane football. These guys will be moving on and hopefully moving up for a lot of them. Uh, Appalachian Power Park uh, will be dormant for a little while. What do you do in the off season? I mean, I've always been curious. What does a baseball team do in the off season, especially at the minor league level? Because there's yeah, so- yeah you don't have guys there. I mean, what do you do? Right. I mean, so, you know, it is it is a lot quieter. I mean, going into this 9 to 5 every day for the last two days has been really weird. I, I'm, I definitely have not felt like, you know, I'm ready to go back to, to 40 hours a week and, you know, all that lovely stuff. So it's interesting, but, uh, you know, we're getting ready for next season. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of things to tidy up. And after that, it's, you know, it's game time. You know, we have a big season coming up next year, obviously with the All-Star game and everything going on. So we're trying to get things ready as soon as possible so that we can be prepared for the 2019 season when it comes around because we know with the All-Star game, we're going to have a lot more on our plates and, you know, we're excited about it. But in the meantime, you know, we're hosting a lot of great events at the ballpark. Of course, you've got the return of Trick or Beat coming on Halloween this year. On October 31st, we've got the pumpkin drop coming up in the middle of October. Uh, there's a couple of other events that we're going to have out there this year in the off season, and for the most part, the ballpark will be silent. But we're going to, you know, we we always host meetings and events out there for different corporate events and stuff like that. So, you know, we we keep it open and, and keep it available for anyone who wants to use it. It's obviously not going to be used for 70 games a season in the off season, but you know, we we still like to keep it rolling and keep it uh, keep keep it available for anyone who wants to uh, partake in. David Kahn joining us from the West Virginia Power. So, Tulane, what's going on there? Tough loss week one. Very tough loss. Uh, you know, it was. I, I basically uh, title it up to classic Tulane. Um, they had a chance to go down and win it in the fourth quarter, and they got a penalty and backed them up, and they were out of field goal range. Out of, out of scoring range, and they went to overtime. You know, credit to Tulane for keeping Wake Forest to 10 points in the second half. And then in overtime, Tulane gets the ball first, which they don't, which you don't necessarily want in overtime, especially against the team you're trying to upset. And they go down the field, get another penalty, and don't score at all. And that happens against a team like Wake Forest. I mean, you're, you know the ball game's over. So they, they lost that one, but, you know, you got to reset, refresh, and get ready for a good team in Nickel State coming in this week to New Orleans because they just beat Kansas this past week in their opener. So, I mean, it's a, it's a big test for, for the Wave in week two, but you know, I think the guys are inspired from everything I've been reading from Coach Willie Fritz and everything like that. Um, you know, I think the guys are inspired and they are, uh, they're ready to go. But I know on your end, big wins for both Marshall and WVU. I mean, the Mountaineers routed Tennessee and Marshall with a a nice win over Miami, Ohio. It's always nice when Marshall beats Miami of Ohio. That's uh, you'll learn that. It's always nice. Oh, I've I've already learned that. Okay. I I was I was I was uh on I was looking on Twitter as the game was happening and as as the game went final, uh pretty much everyone I follow in the city of Charleston, West Virginia went crazy. Good to know. 
good to know you're following some good people there. Um, this one should be fun. <laughs> Marshall's got Eastern Kentucky coming up. And uh, okay. the last time Marshall faced off against Eastern Kentucky was November 27th, 1992. Wow. One double A now FCS playoffs. FCS playoffs. Here. Wow. Forty four nothing as uh the Thundering Herd juggernaut in nineteen ninety two was uh, progressing towards the one double A championship. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is that's gonna be a, a face off for the ages. Nobody remembers that except me and some people who were around here at that time. Nineteen ninety two. I wasn't. I wasn't born yet. Of course, you weren't. Nineteen ninety-two. <laughs> I was. I was at that game. Nineteen ninety-two. <laughs> I was. Uh, I was negative two. David Kahn, our guest from the uh, West Virginia Power. Whew, man, making me old, David. You're making me old. <laughs> Luckily for me, I've got someone older coming on the program next. I've got the voice of the Eastern Kentucky Colonels going to join us. I think he was there in nineteen ninety-two as well. I'm going to ask him. So, um, finally, I get somebody on the show a little uh, older than me. I used to be young. <laughs> I used to be young, and then Woody Woodrum retired. It aged me quickly. You're still, you're still young at heart. That's why we're doing this podcast. True, very true. We're, we'll work on that. David Conner, our guest from the West Virginia Power. Um, we'll check in with you uh, throughout the year for the Tulane updates. <laughs> yes, I will, uh, I will provide any updates you want. You just let me know when you want me on the show, and uh, I'm always available. All right, good deal. David Kahn, West Virginia Power. The Power, unfortunately, missed the playoffs, but uh, the Tulane Green Wave, uh, they've got 11 more shots at it. David will join us soon in the future. We're going to take our next break. We'll come back and we'll talk to the voice of the Eastern Kentucky Colonels, Greg Stodelmeyer. He's going to join us next here on The Drive, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Buckle up, Paul Swan has the wheel on The Drive, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. As we were talking to David Kahn in the last break, uh, the last time Marshall faced Eastern Kentucky was in 1992. As uh, David, the uh, play-by-play announcer of the West Virginia Power, mentioned, he wasn't even born yet. My show producer, Gabriel Sellers, wasn't even born yet. So many people weren't even born yet when Marshall beat Eastern Kentucky back in 92. Thankfully, I've got someone who was around during those times joining me, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome the voice of Eastern Kentucky, Greg Stodelmeyer. And, Greg, you were around. Thankfully, we can talk about this game, and I don't get people scratching their head going, I wasn't even around then. Yeah, uh, um, the basketball team at EKU was in the uh, St. Thomas shootout down in St. Thomas, and so I passed up three games there because we always followed football. And uh, so we had a nice drive over on a Saturday to Huntington and watched the forty-four nothing Marshall win. Uh, if if you remember those that were around, Marcus Thomas who was a great running back at EKU, the all-time at that point leading rusher in one AA football, comes in and gets held to minus four yards. But the game the year before, which was a semifinal game to get to the national title game, was a much more competitive game. Uh, Marshall won 14-7. EKU had a uh, touchdown call back on an illegal man downfield, or it would have been a tie game. And so uh, it's a great series that uh, it resumed in 1986 and, and went through um, that 1992 game. Actually, it resumed in 1985, and man, there were some great games back in the – mid 80s and the early 90s it was uh, it was a great series back then it's just too bad that unlike so many other schools eastern kentucky didn't get on the train to to move up it seems like things are moving in the right direction for eastern kentucky the tradition's still there conference championships are, are coming in all the time uh great history there's been some um, movement towards uh, upgrading facilities, the football facilities getting a facelift. If you could tell me a little bit about that, because the last time I was there, uh, first time ever at the stadium, and I see it from the grandstand side. I come in. It's a bus uh, that the marshal put together for the students. I come to the game, and I get in there, and I look across the field, and there's nothing. It's only half a stadium. Hello. That was just amazing to me at the time. Yeah, I mean, it was. It, there were uh, bleachers on on one side, and then twenty thousand seats on the main side, and it's old. And and 
they they took the bleachers down on on the so-called visitor side and built a built a, a concession stand slash big locker room player lounge type of thing. So uh, it looks much more complete from that standpoint. EKU was was in the running about three years to go three years ago to try to move up to FBS and, and sought membership in the Sun Belt. There was an on campus interview by Sun Belt uh, representatives and. It came down to Eastern Kentucky and Coastal Carolina, and Coastal Carolina was the pick. Uh, since then, there's been uh, major slashes to the higher education budget in the state, and and financially at this point, you know I think uh, any move up to to one A now called FBS football is probably on ice for a while. Still, it would be nice uh, because I'm sure there would be a lot of series that could resume or that would make perfect sense for Eastern Kentucky. Of course, you've got several in the state itself. Western Kentucky right. uh, being in Conference USA has been a great addition, and Marshall would definitely make sense to be on the schedule. Uh, it would be more fun, I'm sure, than playing the Moorhead States of the world because this, it just not doesn't seem like that's a very competitive series, especially looking at the game on Saturday. Eastern Kentucky just had their way with Moorhead and a lot of ground yards gained, uh, over 400. That was really impressive. Right. Morehead State left the Ohio Valley Conference in football only to go to the to the non scholarship or the need based scholarship Pioneer Football League in in 1996, and so since then they've only played sporadically, and and Eastern Kentucky has an advantage. You know, uh, Steve Cotton and I were talking when when we were in Huntington last year for the basketball game, and he, you know, we we see the sensibility of trying to get back to some geographical sensibility. In conference alignments, but when it gets the money in schools, some schools don't want to say, "Well, come on into our club. We've worked hard to get to this level." You know, we were we were here. We're in the Sun Belt now. We're in CUSA, and it's too bad that we don't still have that that connection of like Middle Tennessee, Western Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, and Marshall because I think it it's a good core, and I think it, it is interesting to the fans. But uh, EKU's budget and facilities, even though they've been vastly improved in the last few years, the budget-wise, you know, they're not at the, at, at that level. Uh, back to the game, Eastern Kentucky, they haven't won the OVC since 2011, so there's been a little bit of a downswing, and, and they've been close. But uh, third-year head coach Mark Geller, he's had two losing seasons. I, I really do think Mark's got it pointed in the right direction. Uh, there's more depth on the team, but there's a long way to go. Uh, it's not the Eastern Kentucky of old, and and uh, they're fighting to get the tradition back, and with that, you know, the fans back on board, and and so they're making progress. But uh, they just, you know, they got to get over the hump this year. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Is the downturn more of a result of the budgetary issues, or just that the fans maybe? weren't coming out as much as they used to winning of course always improves that what is it because i do remember a a strong fan base always for eastern kentucky i i think it's across the landscape of football i mean about every game's on some kind of uh, form of television whether it's you know uh a streaming service or or again there's a thousand games on tv every Every weekend, uh, people have more to do with their own families and that type of thing. And Eastern Kentucky's always lived under the, the University of Kentucky shadow to an extent. But but the biggest cure of all is winning. And in recent years, Eastern you know Eastern Kentucky has had uh, five losing seasons in the last forty five, or seasons that were five hundred. In other words, they've had winning seasons all but five in the last forty five, but They've had losing records the last two years and in 2009, and they had a 500 record in 13. So you set a bar a certain place, even if it's an historical bar, it impacts the psyche of the fan. Uh, but again, uh, I, I I do see lighted at the end of the tunnel. And plus, you know, as far as a recruiting base, and I'm sure every school faces this, I think back when Marshall and Eastern Kentucky were going head to head in the mid 80s we didn't have uh well georgia southern had just started a really successful program there wasn't georgia state south alabama uh, south florida central florida was just starting 
there was an FIU, FAU, and I can go on and on. So there were there were great recruits coming out of Florida to EKU. So that recruiting base has eroded a little bit, especially for an FBS school. So the landscape has totally changed, as it should with time. Greg Stodelmeyer joining us, voice of Eastern Kentucky Colonels, Thundering Herd playing host to Eastern Kentucky on Saturday. Uh, I'm excited for this. This is a fun game. And uh, just looking at that Moorhead State game, uh, really impressed with not just the running attack, but I thought all in all that was a really well-balanced win. It felt like there were some guys that could possibly play at the next level. Is, is that a fair assessment, even though we are talking about a win over Moorhead State? Uh, I think the, the rushing numbers are skewed because Moorhead State had a really bad rushing defense the year before. Most of their starters back. Eastern Kentucky will, will this week will face a, a defense against the rush that was in the, the top twenty last year in, in FBS, and so and with most of their players back on the defensive side of the football. So it's going to be a whole different dynamic to see if you can establish a rush. That said. As we look at the entire season, uh, EK will be deeper on the offensive line and more experienced than they, they were last year. They do have good running backs. L.J. Scott is a transfer from Louisville. Jason Lewis from Arizona State. Daryl McCleskey out of Dayton, Ohio, uh, may be the best runner of them all. And so they'll use all three of them. And Alonzo Booth uh, had a great 23-yard run. He's a kid from the, the Columbus area. And so they do have good running backs, and I think they'll be better. That said, uh, I know Mark Elder, the head coach of EKU, is extremely worried. If there's one thing that he worries could get away from EKU, it will be the impact of Marshall's team speed on both sides of the football. Also, was it more just a, because uh, there was the opportunity, but three quarterbacks got played. Dakota Allen, of course, uh, got the majority of action. You, know, you don't anticipate or is that something that Eastern Kentucky likes to do, mix it up a little bit? Last year, uh, Tim Boyle was the starter. He was a UConn transfer, and they wanted to make sure that there was some experience under the belt of then redshirt freshman Austin Scott, who was the other quarterback used last week. So Austin's always played the first series of the second quarter, had a seven for eight dry, uh, passing drive against Kentucky, for example, probably his best of all of his games. When he and, and they stayed with that routine last year and Boyle a uh, really good feel good story free agent with the Packers has made the 53 man roster and so uh, I know everybody at EKU very proud of Tim Boyle being a Packer now with him gone there was a good battle in both spring and through fall camp between Dakota Allen a redshirt freshman and the aforementioned Scott neither player played poorly but neither player grabbed the reins in the final scrimmage, both both players threw an interception in their last drive. Nobody said, Coach, I'm the starter. And so they went into the season against Moorhead State saying, we're going to split the reps. And so one player would play for two or three series, and the other play player would go in. And so Scott and Allen played about as many plays. Alfonso Howard, a junior college transfer, who's a true sophomore, also got on the field and uh, – he will probably as well. So I think you'll see all three quarterbacks. It's not that by design they want to split the time, but they're just in a situation where one quarterback uh, didn't win the job over another one. Joining us on the program, Greg Sotomayor. He's the voice of Eastern Kentucky. The Colonels coming into Huntington for a contest against the Thundering Herd. First time in a long time for football. But, of course, EKU and Marshall, no stranger to each other. I was mentioning earlier, we see Eastern Kentucky and other sports all the time. It's just football where I think people and fans maybe have forgotten there used to be something really special between the two schools. Right, I know the Marshall volleyball team was up here for an exhibition match, and then the EKU women's soccer team was in Huntington the other day, lost on a Friday, and then went to Kentucky and beat UK on Sunday. Uh, the basketball teams have played the last two years, and that rivalry will continue for two more years, and Eastern Kentucky will host Marshall on the season opener here in Richmond, which will be a, a great series. You know, there's a lot of connections between the two schools, in different ways, and uh, 
for instance, Shannon Morrison, who longtime Marshall fans will remember, was a, a captain, one of the captains of the 94 team, was a safety on the uh, 91 and 92 teams, the BDKU, the national championship team in 92. He's the linebackers coach at EKU, former assistant coach at Marshall. So, uh, And I could go on and on about connections. Uh, the former trainer, uh, Tim Pike, was at EKU, joined uh, Doc Holliday's staff as the trainer at Marshall. He's moved on last year to Syracuse. And, and I can go back pre pre you know, tragedy with uh, with some connections as well. So there's uh, with a, a longtime trainer that was there, right, right, and left the summer before the plane crash. So there's a lot of connections, and and you would expect that considering the fact that that the schools are about two hours away from each other. Well, I wish we could get this series to uh, be more of a, a current series and not just uh, every uh, every 25 years. Uh, it would be nice to see uh, if uh, EKU could eventually move up. Do you ever feel that that push will come again to try to make it to that next level? Because it definitely would be, I think, an advantage to have them back at the higher level, or at least Marshall would get a chance to play them again. Uh, I would love to see it, but uh, you know, I think it's you know, I think it's on ice for a while because of the budget situation. You try, you come up just short, and uh, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, you know, I still have just this feeling. Uh, that sometime, and and I really kind of shudder at this, but at some point down the road, the Power Five schools are going to try to exclude everybody and create their own uh, division. But they want the games between the very good non-Power Fives. And I've always said, and Marshall would be a great example of that one when they were in 1AA, uh, the top 20 teams in, in FCA, or at least the top 10 or 15, are just as good as the bottom 20 or 30 teams in, in the FBS. Uh, and, and, you know, already this past weekend, uh, there are 111 games this year on the schedule between FCS and FBS teams. Last weekend, five FCS teams won games. Uh, so it can happen. Uh, and I know in listening to Doc Holliday's press conference, he's made the point to his team, we don't want to be one of those teams. And, uh, you know, I think he's, from what I've seen from afar, he's handling it right to make sure his team's ready to play. Uh, but Eastern Kentucky's come close. Uh, they were they were touchdowns ahead of Kentucky in 14. But Kentucky's field with under six minutes to go, got extended overtime and lost. They were against Kentucky last year and ahead, deep into the third quarter before losing. Uh, their last win came against Miami of Ohio in either 2013 or 14 up in Oxford. So I've got it down. It, happens, it was 2014, it, yeah. yeah. I've got it written down right here. Yeah, 2014, yeah. yeah so so it, it'll happen again. I don't know that Saturday will be the day, but uh, you know, it should be fun, and it should be I'm, I'm looking forward to being back in Huntington again for another good football game. I'm looking forward to it as well. It should be fun. Greg, thanks for joining me. It's been uh, it's been great You're catching welcome. up with you and talking EKU. And uh, let's hope that uh, we can see EKU uh, more on the schedule in the near future. Sounds good. We know it's we know it's tip off of basketball this year, so at least we got two more games in the basketball schedule. Yeah, I'll take I'm that. About, yeah, I'll definitely yeah, and take a former, that. And a, and a former Marshall player is EKU's new head coach, uh, A.W. Hamilton, have played at Marshall, so a uh, little added wrinkle to, to that series. Yeah, uh, that means yeah the two will get after each other a little bit more. definitely will be fun. All right. Greg, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good one. We'll see you Saturday. That is Greg Sotomayor. He um, will be here in Huntington on Saturday for Marshall and Eastern Kentucky. We'll take our final break, and we'll come back and wrap it up. This is The Drive, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. You're listening to The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back. Final segment of today's edition of The Drive here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Getting closer to the Marshall in eastern Kentucky. It was a great chatting with Greg Stuttlemeyer. Get his thoughts on this series. Um, so I'm putting a big circle around the rushing yards. 404 is what Eastern Kentucky had against Moorhead State. But I'm going to put a big asterisk next to that just because, according to Greg, Moorhead's running defense, a little suspect there, especially from last year. So asterisk on that. But 
I still think that they've got some talent there. Uh, L.J. Scott should be a, a good challenge. I think uh, McCleskey will be a, a good challenge for the Thundering Herd as well. Uh, I look for Marshall, though, to definitely win this one. I'm not going to say four touchdowns. Put me on the board for at least two. I will lean three right now. We'll see. Good point. Marshall's definitely going to be faster than Eastern Kentucky. And I think Isaiah Green handled Miami pretty well. Should be able to handle Eastern Kentucky pretty efficiently as well. So that's going to do it for this edition of the show. We're going to be back tomorrow and... We're going to talk soccer. Chris Grassi is going to join me on the program. He's got a big match coming up this week. Also, volleyball is going on tonight at the Henderson Center. So if you're on your way, it starts at 6. If you are in the area, stop by, support Mitch Jacobs and the Marshall Volleyball team. For our producer tonight, he is one Gabriel Sellers. I'm Paul Swan. This has been The Drive here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Good night, everyone. station.